Good morning, Westside. We welcome you to this morning service from the Giesbrecht family. Um, we're glad that you're being part of it this morning, and uh, Lynn's going to share first a little bit. Okay, well, it looks like this is going to be going out on March 14th, and I just have to stop and think about March 14th a year ago. Uh, at that point in time, actually, half of my household was on the other side of the world. Josh was with the grade 12s in Sri Lanka, and Dawn was with uh, Pastor Danny and Dave and Sonny in Kenya. And I just want to share that I just had peace that whole time that they were going to be fine. Wherever they ended up, they were going to be fine. And thankfully, they were part of the one million people that came back to Canada in that crazy last week of March. So really thankful about that. So then just fast forward to now in the pandemic, um, life has been just as busy as ever for me because of teaching and symphony and so on. But the word, my, my thought that I keep coming back to is, uh, it's words from an old chorus and it had, um, or maybe it was a different course, but it was about others are lost on the raging sea and then others, Lord, yes, others, let this my motto be, help me to live for others that I might live like thee. So those are the words that I often just come back to that whatever, if I feel like giving up, if I feel like, oh, I really don't feel like going to work today, that's my prayer, Lord, what can I do for somebody else today? How can I encourage somebody else? Uh, how can I be a blessing? Um, whatever it is, that's that's what I ask him. And I he just helps me get through my day. And just I find that when you just look to others and how can you help them, that really just helps. Um, so that's my encouragement. That's my that's my word. I don't have lots of deep words, but that's kind of what keeps me going. So over to you. Well, it ties in this book. I have one scripture that I want to share. It's probably my, one of my favorites. It's uh, Isaiah 61, 11. And it says, For as the soil makes the sprout come up, and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. So that's a very good spring scripture. And um, we just need to keep loving on people. And... Uh, I think we, you know, we're going to get back together really soon here. Um, I believe that, and I'm glad for that. But I also just want to encourage you that there's there's so many out there that need that need our love. So we love you. Amen. Have a good have a good Sunday. Thank 
My heart. 
heart and flesh cry out to you, the living God. Your spirit's water for my soul. I've tasted and I've seen. Come once again to me. I will draw near to you. There's nothing like your presence. There's nothing like your house.
praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit praise the King Thank you, worship team, for leading us in worship this morning. It's Lucas here with this week's announcements. Uh, set your self a reminder for West Side Stories uh, this Tuesday at 7 p.m. You can check it out on our YouTube channel. This week we're having uh, Dr. Randy Johnson coming on, Pastor Marlowe's brother. He's going to be discussing his latest book, and uh, I'm sure he'll have an encouraging word for all of us. We have a good news update for you in regards to the Pocot children. The uh, money that we sent out has arrived and is uh, being used to buy all the food and bedding that they need. Uh, also, another $900 have already come in. Thank you for your generosity. Uh, that money will be sent a little bit later to help provide for their ongoing needs. If you would like to contribute to those ongoing needs um, for those orphans, you can e-transfer the office. Just designate your giving as Pocot Children. For general tithes and offerings, you can e-transfer the office or you can swing by the office during regular business hours. If you have any questions about how to give, you can check out our website, wffpg.ca slash give or give the office a call. And now with some testimony, we have... Arlene Haste, and then Chris and Michaela Spiker. Take a listen. Good morning, my Westside family. There have been different life verses for me over the years. Psalm 56 verse 8 says, You keep track of all my sorrows. You've collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. And Psalm 38 verse 9 says, You know what I long for, Lord. You hear my every sigh. In the Passion Paraphrase, the writer says, my tears are liquid words, and you can read them all. So many times I have wept over my lifetime. I've wept tears of repentance and tears of sorrow, tears in intercession and tears of empathy. These verses tell me that God is a tender-hearted father to me. He feels with me and he weeps with me. He doesn't see these tears as worthless. He values them. And when I have no words and only tears, he understands what it is I'm pouring out to him. He is for me. He's on my side. He knows me intimately. And one day, one day, he's going to wipe away every tear from my eyes and I won't need them anymore. The other verses I have are found in Psalm 92 and it's verses 10 and 12 to 14. And I'm going to read them out of the New Living Translation. It says, but you have made me as strong as a wild ox. You have anointed me with the finest oil. And verse 12 to 14 says, But the godly will flourish like palm trees and grow strong like the cedars of Lebanon. For they are transplanted to the Lord's own house. They flourish in the courts of our God. Even in old age, they will still produce fruit. They will remain vital and green. What stood out to me in these verses is, You have made me strong, and you have anointed me with the finest oil. The godly will flourish like palm trees grow strong like the cedars of Lebanon. Even in old age, they will still produce fruit. They will remain vital and green. The word that's been ringing in my spirit for months now has been more. There's always more, more of his spirit, more of his goodness, his grace, his empowering. The Septuagint, <laughs> if anybody knows me, I'm all heart and 0% Bible scholar, but anyway, that's the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And it says, I will raise my horn high like a rhinoceros. And in my old age, I will still have plenty of oil or anointing. How can I raise my horn high? I believe it starts right now in the posturing of myself when I'm not so very old yet. Always looking up for or to my source. Looking up with expectation being like the widow woman with her son and Elijah asks her to make him a meal and she chooses to use the last of her flour and oil in obedience. 
and God caused the oil and flour to not run out. For me, this is choosing to be spilled out, using the anointing of the Holy Spirit every day so that I can be filled up again and again. This anointing oil can be and will be a beautiful fragrance that brings all the glory to God. I have said for years that as I get older, I don't want to be the one to just sit back and watch life go by, but I want to be more filled with the Spirit and be poured out and used until my dying day. That's it, my Westside family. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And remember, there's always more. Hi, Westside family. My name's Michaela. And my name's Chris. We're going to share a passage of scripture with you that has meant a lot to us and it meant a lot for how we define our faith. You probably know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the fiery furnace. We're going to start off where those three are standing in front of the fiery furnace with King Nebuchadnezzar, who's telling them to forsake their God and bow down to his gods instead. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this manner. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Yeah, so this Bible story really spoke to us um, with that phrase stuck right in the middle, but even if he doesn't, that these uh, believers in Christ were standing before their death, believing that their God can save them. But they say, but even if he doesn't, we will not bow. And to us, it just motivated us to have that new level of faith that our faith isn't defined by if God's going to save us, if God's going to give us money, if God's going to heal us, if God's going to keep us safe, if God's going to do anything. It's like, if God does this, then I will have faith. It's more of like, but even if he doesn't, I'm going to I'm going to choose God every time. And with our jobs, we get exposed to some crazy, dangerous situations sometimes. And we just think upon that verse where we know God wants to save us. We know he can. But even if he doesn't, we're going to go in. And when we raise our family and we have all these other problems come up and life happens, we just think to ourselves, but even if he doesn't, we're going to keep the faith and trust that he will deliver us. So we just wanted to share that with you guys, and we're going to sing a song right now that correlates with that Bible verse. There's a grace when the heart is under fire, another way when the walls are closed.
Last week, I introduced a new series that I'm calling Embracing the Cross. And in this series, I want us to take a deep look into the multifaceted dimensions of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week, we looked at Matthew chapter 26, where Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, just hours before his arrest and his crucifixion, was praying to his Father. And if I was to paraphrase his prayer, it would go something like this. Father, if there was a, another way to fulfill the redemptive purposes of God, could we go that direction? Is there another way to provide salvation to humanity? But what is so uh, powerful about these three prayers that Jesus prayed to the Father in this scene in, is that each time he ended the prayer by saying, not my will, but your will be done. And in so doing, Jesus embraced his cross, providing the ultimate example to you and I as followers of Jesus, what it means to embrace the cross. You see, embracing the cross, as we talked about last week, is surrendering our will to the will of the Father and embracing his purpose for our life. In the next four weeks, I hope to further our appreciation of the cross as we consider more deeply what the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ means to each and every one of us. I hope we can with greater passion say we love the cross and we want to, we want to embrace the cross afresh in our lives. We're going to focus on four facets of salvation that actually flows from the work of the cross. And these four facets answer the four problems with man's standing with God. The first word is the word propitiation, a big fancy word that is referring to the answer to God's wrath. See, the cross of Christ is the answer to the wrath and the judgment of God as a holy God. The second word that we'll focus on in the coming weeks is the word reconciliation. And reconciliation is the answer to our estrangement to God and to one another. The third word is the word redemption, which provides the answer to our enslavement to sin. And then today we're going to focus on the word sacrifice. Sacrifice is the answer to our guilt and shame. You see, we are, we are guilty before God. We fall short of the glory of God. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. Have you ever been found guilty of something? I remember as a young boy, I think I was around nine or 10 years of age, uh, my friend and I uh, decided we would try to smoke cigarettes. And so he was able to steal a couple of cigarettes from his parents. And we would, went out in the bush and we were, we were lighting these cigarettes and it was so exhilarating because we were, we were breaking the rules. We were, we were uh, doing something that was forbidden to us. Uh, I remember distinctly not liking smoking in any way, shape or form, but I faked it in front of my friend saying, oh, this is, this is really good uh, as a young nine and 10 year old. And we ended up, after smoking those one or two cigarettes, we went back to my house, and there was somewhat of a, a family gathering that was taking place. And one of my aunts looked at us, and she cornered us, and she said, you two have been smoking, haven't you? To this day, I do not know how my Auntie Donna knew that we were smoking. And we flatly denied. We said, no way, we were not smoking. She cornered us and said, let me smell your breath. No, you don't want to smell our breath. Our breath is bad, or maybe it's smoke from the campfire, or whatever crazy excuses we were giving to try to get out of being cornered uh, from, from the uh, reality that we were doing something we shouldn't have been doing. We were guilty. On the larger cosmic level, we are all guilty before God. Each and every one of us have fallen short of the holy standard of God, the righteousness of God we fall short of, and we have been found guilty. And what I want to say today in this teaching is that the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross 
is the answer to that guilt. Let's begin by looking at the Old Testament and going to the very beginning in the creation account. The problem of guilt is seen at the very beginning in the creation account with Adam and Eve. You see, Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Paul says this, Sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. But as we look at the creation account, we know that God created man and man and woman he created in his image, placed them in the garden. All of their needs were met. God said to Adam and Eve, of all the trees of the garden you can eat from, but that tree in the middle, that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, do not eat of that tree because the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And then as we read in Genesis chapter 3, the serpent comes in, tempts Eve to eat of that tree, and then shares it with Adam. And then uh, we pick it up in verse 8 of Genesis chapter 3. And it says this, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I have commanded you not to eat? Let's just point out a few observations from this passage. First of all, we see that as God was coming in to the presence of Adam and Eve, they were hiding. They were hiding from his presence. You know, the question has often been asked uh, by seekers, by agnostics, by atheists, uh, this question, why doesn't God make himself more obvious? And some might say, if, if God painted this neon cross in the sky and wrote in these big flaming letters, Jesus saves, then I would believe. Why doesn't God provide more evidence? I think the uh, part of the answer to that challenge and that question is found in this passage. Notice it wasn't God hiding from Adam and Eve. It was Adam and Eve that were hiding from God. And they were hiding because they, for the first time, felt shame. They were guilty, and as a result, had to hide from the holy presence of God. The second thing that we can notice very clearly in this passage is that they knew they were naked. There was this open sense of shame that they experienced that they had not experienced before they sinned. So there was this feeling of, of shame and exposure, which really points to the cross because those that were crucified were stripped naked. And Jesus was naked on the cross, uh, fully exposed to the world as he was bearing the sins of this world. The third dynamic that we can see in this creation account is that there was guilt avoidance. You see, guilt is something that is so uh, unpleasant to our emotional health that we can't live in a guilty place. So we have to do something with that guilt. We have to deflect it. We have to blame something else, somebody else. And so when God approached Adam, did you eat of the tree? He says, well, she gave it to me to eat. God confronted Eve, and of course she deflected the blame to the serpent, and so it goes. And so guilt is so uh, difficult to live with that it causes all kinds of, of uh, very challenging human dynamics as we blame others and as we deflect the blame, and it causes issues in our relationships and so forth. So there was guilt avoidance that was there. So we see the problem of guilt right from the very, very beginning. Now, this the, problem of guilt is seen throughout the Old Testament being addressed through sacrifices. Throughout salvation history, sacrifice was the means to approach a holy God. But even before we read about the institutionalized uh, sacrificial system through Moses, we see it earlier on in the Bible as well, in Genesis chapter 4 with Cain and Abel. 
You see, Cain brought fruits of the soil as an offering, which was a direct violation of God's known will. And that offering was rejected, where his brother Abel, Abel brought fat portions, and that offering was accepted. And so the fat offerings obviously had to do with the sacrifice of an animal and the shedding of blood. Now, through Moses, there's many types of sacrifices that we could talk about and read about in the Old Testament. But suffice it to say for this teaching, some general characteristics that we see in these Old Testament sacrifices. Number one, that they, the animal was to be without blemish, which of course points to the sinlessness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Two, that the offerer was to lay hands on the animal and in, in so doing, the animal was willingly accepting that, that position as one who was going to be sacrificed, which again points to the Lord Jesus Christ, who willingly gave himself as a sacrifice for you and I. Three, the animal was slain, which of course points to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and the shedding of blood. And then fourth, and this is really interesting, the peace offering eat, was eaten by the worshipers. So the high priest and the one offering, uh, offering the sacrifice were able to eat the portions of the animal together. And so doing, it was called a, a fellowship or a, a peace offering, which is an interesting connection to the New Testament practice of communion. And the, the table of the Lord, the communion table where we, we remember the death of of the Lord Jesus Christ. We partake in that emblem of the bread and the emblem of the wine together, remembering the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in so doing, we're not only having fellowship with God, but we have fellowship with one another as we partake of the meal together. The Old Testament sacrifices certainly drives home the seriousness of sin. Sin needs to be atoned for. There needs to be punishment meted out because of your sin and my sin. And the death penalty is clearly, uh, the, the penalty for sin is clearly death. And so the animal dies in the Old Testament in place of the worshiper. Now, as we come to the New Testament, we see that the guilt of humanity is really only fully dealt with through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. The animal sacrifices of the, only of the Old Testament only pointed to the ultimate sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to read from Matthew chapter 27 from verses 45 to 50, Matthew's account of the final uh, moments on the cross for Jesus. Verse 45 says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, Lima, Sebastani. That is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. There's several characteristics about the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross that I'd like us to look at in our concluding time together. Number one, Christ's sacrifice was the Father's will. You see, Jesus was not a martyr. He willingly gave himself up as a sacrifice for our sins. We see that even played out with the Roman guards who were there doing their duty, doing their jo job, guarding Jesus on the cross. And it was the result of the Father's will, not that they that Jesus was a martyr and that he was, took a, he was taken against his will. Second of all, we see that Christ's sacrifice alone can atone for our sin. And we see a lot of this discussed in the book of Hebrews. We see that uh, Christ's sacrifice was singular. It was once and for all 
for all time. We see that his sacrifice was permanent, and we see that it was offered in heaven. It was a sacrifice that was not offered in a human temple, but it was a, a sacrifice that was offered before the Father himself. And then thirdly, we see that Christ's sacrifice satisf satisfies sin's judgment. And that's where this word propitiation comes in that we will look at in another Sunday. But the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ satisfied the wrath of God, that God as a righteous judge rightfully has anger toward disobedience and sin. But Jesus on the cross was the propitiation or appeased the wrath of God. In this passage that we read in Matthew, and we read about it in other Gospels as well, we read that there was darkness that covered the earth from noon to three. And so in those final hours of Jesus Christ on the cross, darkness was over the land. Now, some people have tried to speculate as to the, maybe a natural cause of this darkness. Was there an eclipse? Uh, was it a very, very severe dark storm? Uh, and so forth, which I think is an exercise in futility, because it's clear throughout the Bible that judgment represents, excuse me, darkness represents judgment. And the judgment of God during those hours that, were, that was literally being poured out upon the body of the Lord Jesus Christ was absolutely astounding, amazing. And we see the, the, in the midst of this darkness, Jesus in this, in this cry of desolation cries out, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? So in the, in the, in the central part of Jesus dying on the cross, there is, uh, there is a separation between the Lord Jesus Christ and his Father to the point where he cries out, why have you forsaken me? There's, for the first time in eternity, there was that the breaking of relationship, that separation of the Father's gaze upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because judgment was being poured out upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 says this, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. So picture with me. The earth had become dark. Jesus was suffering on the cross. He cries out this cry. Other gospels uh, indicate that he cries out, it is finished. The judgment of God is being poured up, out upon the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that whole time period, Paul says, in, in, again in 2 Corinthians 5 and 19, that during this time, God was reconciling the world to himself. Now, we, if you are a Christian parent, you've probably, no doubt, have said to your children, uh, Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And your child probably readily accepts that on a very surface level. But the depths of what was really taking place that God was doing the work of reconciling the world to himself as the punishment for sin was being poured out upon the, the body of Jesus Christ. I think it's going to take all of eternity for us to fully understand and grasp all the levels and the depths of what that really means as Jesus Christ was that ultimate sacrifice. Then finally, uh, we can't talk about a sacrifice without talking about the issue of blood. You think about the Old Testament animal sacrifices. Well, blood was everywhere. It was a messy affair. And let's consider the, the, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he endured before the actual crucifixion. Bob Sorge and his series on the secret of the secret places talks about it as a, a spectacle of blood. There was blood on his head. There was blood throughout his, his hair and down his face and, 
and down the, his, his body, down his arms. There was blood down flowing past on his legs, down his feet, all over the cross and on the ground at the bottom of the cross. It was a, a spectacle of blood. In Romans chapter 3, verse 25, it says that God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of blood. There is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. Jesus shed his blood for you and I. Envision that blood that was flowing so freely from the body of Jesus Christ and down his body and on the cross. Envision with me that blood being applied to your spirit as we appropriate the power of that blood in our own lives. You know, one of the practices that um, we've been involved in the last few years in our early morning prayer time, our corporate prayer time that we have every single morning, is we celebrate or begin those prayer times with communion. It was a couple of years ago, one of the folks uh, came to me and said, well, can we, can we celebrate communion at the beginning of every prayer time? I said, yeah, let's do it. And, and we, there's a number of us, 12 to 15 of us recently, have been meeting every single morning, and we begin those times with communion. And not too long ago, I remember as I was leading one of the communion times, and as we're taking the cup to share communion together, I just found myself praying concerning the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and just praying out loud and encouraging others to, to receive the healing properties of the, from the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And before you partake in that cup that represents his blood that was shed for you and I, by faith we say, cleanse us, Lord. Cleanse us. Wash us of sin. Bring healing to our bodies. Bring wholeness to our spirit. Bring health to our minds. And just receiving that healing power of his blood that was shed on the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love Hebrews 10, 19 that says this, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Listen to this, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. The sprinkling of blood that cleanses an evil conscience. You know, that speaks to not a one-time experience, but that is referring to our, our, our spiritual journey in an ongoing way. Ongoing way. So every day as we, as we uh, start our day, we can say, Jesus, sprinkle my evil conscience. Sprinkle me with your blood so that I can come boldly into your throne room of grace and stay there. The blood of Jesus enables us to have a relationship and have fellowship with God. And referring back to Bob Sorge, he talks about this in a very eloquent way. There's, there's, we have to be righteous to come into the presence of God. And there's two ways of doing that. Uh, we can be absolutely per be perfect in thought and deed. We can be absolutely righteous, and then we can go in on our own merits into the presence of God. Or if you're like me, and I know that you are because we all are in the same place, we need our evil consciences cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by faith, we appropriate that work. Say, Jesus, cleanse me. Let that blood just begin to fall over me. Cleanse me, making me righteous. And Lord, here I am as your son and as your daughter. As you know, I've been in Kenya a couple of times now, and uh, many things are different when you go to a foreign land. And one of the things that I noticed was very different was that all the Western-style malls uh, were heavily secured. Walls around them, you had to go through metal detectors. At times, you had to be searched or your bags had to be searched. And I asked uh, one of our traveling companions at the time, why is that the case? And they said, well, there was a, a terrorist attack some years ago, and that was the end of the conversation. But just this week, I was reading the story 
that actually uh, precipitated that kind of security in the malls. It was back in September of 2014, and a number of gunmen went into a mall in Nairobi, Ken Kenya, and they ended up uh, massacring over 60 people and injuring 200 people. There's a story of one woman who was in the midst of all that, and she was hiding under a table and praying that the gunmen wouldn't find her and shoot her. And in that time frame, the cell phone of the person laying beside her went off. And as she turned over to try to find that cell phone to turn it off, she realized that the person there was, the man there was dead. And not only was he dead, but there was blood everywhere. He was just bleeding profusely. And she made a very crucial decision right at that moment. She decided to take that man's blood and smear it all over her so that she could in some way fool these murderers that she was also dead. And in so doing, she, her life was saved. And she accredits the blood of this man to the saving of her life from these, from these terrorists. Today, as we have talked about the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, the shedding of his blood that removes our guilt, that is, the, uh, that is the payment for our sin. I trust afresh as we seek to embrace the cross of Jesus Christ that we can fully appreciate the sacrifice that Jesus Christ became for you and I. If we're dealing with guilt, if we're dealing with, with sin in our lives because we've never come and appropriated by faith uh, the power of his blood in our lives, I want to encourage you to do so today. Let us pray together and let's pray again that God would sprinkle our hearts with afresh with his blood and cleanse our evil conscience. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the sacrifice of your son. I thank you for the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. And Lord, today I pray for each person listening to this message, God, that, that you would stir up our faith to appropriate the power of your blood and your sacrifice in our lives afresh. Cleanse us, forgive us, enable us to come with boldness into your presence because of your sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, and we're going to continue on this series of Embracing the Cross. Mm -hmm.